here to talk about cats with the magnificent Dr. Margie Sharik. And thank you, Base Paws, for giving us this format. Um, this is a tough talk today. Uh, and so, you know, my energy level is a little bit different, but I really believe that there is beauty in all things and sometimes the hardest things. And Dr. Sherrick and I are gonna follow up today on the talk that we did on November 18th, um, talking about senior cats. And that kind of had a natural progression into end of life. And it's a big topic and it's a hard topic. And so often we just don't talk about it, but um, Dr. Sherrick and I are not afraid of hard things. So um, we're gonna we're gonna talk you through it today, and I hope that you get some good information, some good tools, and that we can have a discussion. Um, we're gonna be really actively looking into our uh, our um, chat box here, and we want to know um, the questions that you have and what you want to say. So thank you so much, Dr. Sherrick, for being here again and for providing all these great slides and great information. Um, Dr. Bales, it's always a, it's always a pl pleasure. And can we drop the doctor stuff? <laughs> sure, Liz and Margie. Here we go. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> well, I think it matters because um, at, in you know this is an emotional thing, but it is also a medical thing. And um, the level of expertise that you bring with I don't even know. I guess I won't say a million years of uh, of clinical expertise and academic expertise. It, it matters. It matters to people trying to make the right choice. Um, well, it is that it, that's what we're going to be talking about, how it is the, the it's the balance between um, the medical and the um, non-medical, the science and the art. It's really about, um, you know, the intuition and empathy uh, are um, as important as the medical aspects. Yeah, it really is. And so we're going to just review a little bit of um how we we think about you know preventative care um and when that becomes you know we really can't we really can't uh prevent disease anymore we're in the throes of disease and we're managing it and then when that moves into palliative care and keeping animals comfortable for end of life it's it's a spectrum and how do you know where you are right and it's and uh you know both uh, uh win and um uh, let me get back up here now. Wynn and Marilyn have said that they've got, you know, five senior cats and we define for what it's worth that or based on AFP defined as, as being uh, greater than 10 years of age. But the end of life is variable because, of course, a youngster could be dying from something or a, a senior cat like it could be somebody who is um, 11 or, you know, in their 30s, for heaven's sakes, as far as uh, when that when the end of life process begins. So it really is a process, isn't it? Yeah. And sometimes it's it, we don't get a lot of preparation. And we'll, we'll talk about that as we go along, too. I had a, a four year old cat that had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and I didn't get a lot of warning. Yeah. Um, so sometimes we can prepare and and sometimes not. Um, so uh, how, when do we talk about these these treatable diseases? Sure. You know that uh, you know when we're we're dealing with something that we can actually um, make a make a difference with in terms of cure or or you know treatment that's going to extend life and when when that's not in the cat's best interest anymore. Absolutely. So last time we talked about and and certainly whether it was last time or not, treatable things and they're very very common in cats as they get older. In fact, we expect to see chronic kidney disease. If I see an eighteen year old cat who's not um, got any uh, bio, uh, biomedical or biochemical evidence of kidney disease, I'm scratching my head because that's not normal uh, per se. It certainly isn't usual. Hyperthyroidism, many of you may have cats with hyperthyroidism or, or diabetes. Dental diseases, that is absolutely, um, uh, is absolutely uh, common in actually all cats over about three years of age. Arthritis um, is really common, decreased mobility and hypertension. So you know, it's really important that our veterinarians are measuring blood pressure um, uh, at, at, certainly in any cat over six years of age, not even, not even now, just over 10 years of age. So those are you know, certainly diseases that we've got. And because of the, all the screening that we're doing, which in, in the veterinary profession, that, that you are, um, you're not only by allowing us to screen your cats, um, help allowing us to help them, but you're also helping us get information for cat 
hood, as it were, you know, cat dumb, as it were. And cats are living longer um, with older age, come chronic conditions like the ones that I've, I've mentioned. And well, often- I just want to point out last time when we talked, I really like the way you framed this mm. in that uh, a lot of these, we expect them. It's, it's, they're going to be living with these issues um, for hopefully a long time. And so management of uh, aging and disease processes are, we can think about it differently and not, um, not let it be so scary, you know, just that this is part of getting older and here's what we're going to do about it. And how can we do that as best we can and, and not, not, um, panic so much. Yeah. So these, the, I think you're referring to age appropriate. Um, I think that was the, the, the term that I, I used and a lot of these cats have multiple conditions going on. And in fact, I'm, I'm looking here uh, at a comment from, um, uh, at, at, a, at a comment here from, from Heather uh, with uh, hyperthyroidism and uh, who went, underwent uh, radioiodine. And it sounds based on what you're saying, Heather, that, uh, that he, what's happened is, is that pre-existing chronic kidney disease has been uncovered by the correction of his hyperthyroidism. And so that that needs to be managed um, um, as well uh, to, to make sure that he's eating and he's staying hydrated. Um, and, and uh, you know, he, he may need appetite stimulants. He may need um, uh, to certainly need some, some fluids, but because a lot of times in cats, this is what makes feline medicine fun is the fact that we've got multiple things going on at once. So, I mean, it's not uncommon to find somebody with diabetes hyperthyroidism, chronic kidney disease, and hypertension plus dental disease at the same time, you know. And I love that you're going to give us some some scales and tools to kind of evaluate how, you know, give us some structure for how to think about these things. Because like Anne is talking about here, she has an eight-year-old cat that has chronic kidney disease. And how how long can she expect to, for her cat to feel good? And maybe it's a very long time. Exactly. And maybe it's not. And how do you know? And so I think for the, for the cat parent, living in that uh, place of unknown can make you feel panicked. And, um, and, and I would love for some of this information to give us a way to um, have tools instead of panic and then establish a relationship with sort of a like-minded veterinarian where um, you can talk about what, what what are your boundaries? What, what are, you know, we're going to talk a lot today about and what are your fears? What are yeah. your, what are your what fears? Are you? And what because it, if you talk about what your fears are, then we know what's important for you to know about. What's important for you to be able to feel you have a, have some degree of control over. Because yeah. again, we can keep them living a long time, but is longer life necessarily better life? Do we? Yeah. You know, is is sure? I mean, humans are living longer than ever, or, or life expectancies prior to the pandemic continued to go, uh, to continue to increase, but is that necessarily a healthy longer life, you know, and or I, are you I simply spending say, longer time, um, uh, with cognitive dysfunction and, um, and, uh, crippled in a, in a, in a long-term care facility? Yeah. And just because we can treat things, does that mean we should treat things? And, and this is again, where it, it has to be a conversation, um, with with someone that you, you feel like you can exchange ideas with in a in a um, mutually respectful way. Yeah. So we we are getting so much feedback already. This is from great. Yeah. I'm just I'm like just looking. Cats of all ages, and we had a poll because we kind of yeah. wanted to know what what were what age groups we're dealing with. Yeah. So why don't you tell us, please? Um, then the first the first please answer the first poll. How old is your oldest cat or was your oldest cat where you know for sure how old they were or not, you think they were, okay? Because a lot of times we don't really know because we get them as young adults from the SBCA or something and we think they're one and then maybe we find out later based on dental x-rays that in fact they're six or something like that. So why don't you just um, fill that one in please and then... Um, can we get the results off of, off of that um Casey without having both of them filled in or do we need both of them filled in look and see maybe Casey can talk with me in the private chat box and let's see if um we can get that information and if 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 not we can just answer all three of them straight off that you know the next one is how old is or was the uh the oldest known cat um sort of in in not living with you but otherwise Let's see what you think there. 
And then have you ever wished you'd said goodbye to an elderly cat sooner than you did? Yes or a no? Is this, this is the regret factor. Yeah. And we're hopefully going to give you some tools so that you don't go through that regret again. Or worry, is it too soon? Is it too late? Oh, I left it too late. You know, and, you know, when I was a young vet many moons ago, um, I really thought I could make this easier for people in terms of, um, well, you'll know, you'll know. And then when it was my own pets mm-hmm. after I had become a vet, and so I had all the tools and all the knowledge and I had, I had you know, part of my job is euthanizing and I probably euthanized maybe thousands of animals at that point, you know, at end of life appropriate, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I, I struggled terribly with the right time. So I, I, I don't think that there, it's like, um, you know, uh, like, a, like a test in school that you're absolutely gonna know yes or no. Um, it's a hard decision and, and it's as much art as it is science. Yeah, it is. Um, uh, Casey, can you fire in those uh, poll answers? Let's see what everybody said. I think. I don't know how, you know what? I can't execute that, I don't think. No, no, uh, she has there to we go. that, I think. She's got to execute oh, that. Oh, so our, our so. audience here is, is a very geriatric audience. Okay, so, I'm not seeing this. Well, that maybe, maybe. It's the in the chat box. It's coming up that um, the, uh, the okay, question at the bottom one, then maybe. Hmm? the age group is 14 to 17. Is okay, our, is our is the majority of them. And then the, um, how old was the oldest cat? Uh, 31 is okay. the winner. Okay. And good. Mostly people say, no, they don't feel like they did it too soon. Good. Okay, good. Um, yeah, and Jenny is saying that if you know your pet, you'll know when the time is right. Well, you do, but you also, uh, I mean, it, it, you, 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 it depends on if, what you're listening with. If you're listening with your brain, it gets, you, you don't. If you listen just with, and if you listen with your heart, it's composed. You just have to somehow open up, and this sounds totally quack a noodle, but you just have to be open. And then you go, oh, good. Now I'm seeing the poll results. Now it, it, you just have someone be open and they will tell you, but it's, it's, it can be, it can be difficult. And let's give you some, let's give you some yeah. tools. Mo- Molly's asking me here what, um, what I say now, instead of you'll know. Um, and I just open the door to that. It, it's a, it can be a real struggle. And just it, for me personally, um, I think trying to make sure that you're thinking of what's in the best interest of the cat. And that's what we're going to talk about. So let's get on to some of the some of the data that we have here. And we'll sure. just a light moment. Yeah, this is just a light <laughs> a light moment. So this is from Wikipedia, and the only one the one that has uh, uh, has been confirmed is and is in the Guinness Book of Records is cream puff. And so we're talking thirty nine or almost or, or over thirty eight years. That's amazing. It's just amazing. It's just amazing. And there's there's a total of like thirty one in this in this list. So it, wow. this isn't you know in their thirties is not is not um, uh, uncommon at all. So this you, is what cream puff- in your, Anecdotally in your career, have you seen one breed or another that you think, uh, for me, all of my ancient cats where I, where I spent most of my career were Siamese. Siamese or domestic, domestic cats, um, mm-hmm. but not the, not the other purebreds other than Siamese. So this is what cream puff looks like or looked like. And uh, this was you know, verified um, uh, in the, by Guinness. That couldn't have been at the end. She looks great. No. No, that absolutely could not have been, not, absolutely could not have been. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Barbara's experience is really, is, is a really awful uh, experience where she felt that the, you know, veterinarian was only, uh, uh, kept pushing drugs on, on um, her cat and the kitty seized and, and died. And that might've been a question of, 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 of uh, blood pressure not being treated or, or the like, or, or having too much erythropoietin on board um, for chronic kidney disease. And this but, is what but the, point, the point is, is it was a horrible experience. A horrible the experience. Is, and, the point and is, is so that- many times- in that case, it's a failure of communication. It's a fail, absolute failure. Of, absolute I get so sad when people um, presume that it's the money. It may be that the vet didn't do a good job explaining why they were offering all of the drugs and what were the pros and cons of it and walking you through it. Um, I, I just, I don't know vets that throw 
drugs unnecessarily at people. I, I just don't know. That. I, I'm, I'm sure that, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure that it, that, that, it, that this happens. I don't doubt Barbara's experience at all. I, yeah. I don't doubt your experience, but it's, uh, you know, the, the veterinarians are pretty much never in it for the money because you don't go into veterinary medicine for fame or fortune. Um, there's because the, those aren't not available for, for, for most people. Not so it's not, it's not, that's not it. You know, we go in because we can't stand um, seeing individuals hurt and we want to fix them and make them, make them not hurt, which really brings us to the, you know, when it isn't treatable, when it isn't treatable at what point in that. And I did see somebody, um, uh, I did say, see somebody say that it wasn't a question of it being too late, but rather it was Eva who said it was, it was, she's concerned that maybe she said goodbye too soon. And that's a, you know, that's a, a, a different conversation. And, it's, a, it's a, certainly a different regret, but there was for sure no suffering. Um, and I, I don't know what else else to say there. Um, I, I think that, gosh, while I want to live every day that I that is is granted to me, um, I, I want it to be comfortable and if it is and, and not a burden on others and I want it to be um, uh, fruitful and helpful to, to others. And if it's um, not, and I'm, I'm shorted a few days, I would honestly rather that than be a burden or be in a great deal of pain. Um, and, and this is where I say with it, when I used to say, you'll know, and I feel badly about that because the, it, this is a very difficult topic. It's an emotional topic. And if there were clear answers, you wouldn't need this conversation. So, so having some grace with each other and, um, and trying to figure it out uh, with mutual respect is, is the hardest. Because on that day, Margie, when, when, if it, when your day comes, you know, it's gonna be really hard to, to, maybe you can't communicate. Maybe someone is trying yes. to do what's in your best interest and not getting it right. I just think that it isn't black and white and, and we just need a lot more grace. Yeah, we do. And so, but we need to also have, it, it really helps to have a, it really helps to have a plan. Um, so, you know, we, we want to be thinking about first, what is quality of life? We need to define, try to define this. And I like um, asking um, uh, pet parents to, you know, keep a diary uh, and not just from when you're worried about them being ill, but rather uh, from, you know, when they're young and happy and healthy, um, so that you know, or maybe not young, but where, where as far as you're concerned, they're fine, you know, that you, so that you may know what they, what they do, but if you write it down, it really helps because that way, you know how we otherwise second guess yourself, or at least I do myself. It's like, well, was it, you know, does he, does he poop twice a day or once a day? Well, is it, is it Mondays, you know, is it three times a week that he poops or, you know, and, and, and well, he generally likes to poop in that corner and, and he gets up at, he, he um, uh, loves his breakfast, but he's lazy about his dinner and this kind of stuff. And to know these things, what their normal behaviors are, doesn't mean that cats can't change what they do, but this, gives you something that you can then look back at and go yeah you know he stopped doing that because the changes are often really gradual and so if you can if you can look back and go oh my gosh that's only six months ago that he really that he came running when I got home or and he'd he'd uh, you know jump around me really excitedly in the kitchen when it when I put the groceries you know in and so that's really helpful for you to compare to and and then when you're um, wondering about gosh, is it time? Not only do you have that to look at, but you can also do a little scale of one to 10. This is really simple where you just go, how's he feeling this morning? And you just jot it down on, on a calendar. I mean, you can jot it down on, on your uh, phone calendar, whatever, on a scale of one to 10, you know, where I figure that seven is about as good as it gets because seven is sort of the day I, uh, the day I, you know, I mean, the day you get married, the day you graduate, those are, those are tens, you know, but there's, you know, the day you hold your first child, that's, that's a 10, but those aren't most of the time, most of the time we live at, or I live at, I think about a seven out of 10 and that's great. So if you can jot down in the, in the morning, it's a, it's a three and in, and then the evening it's a four and the next day it's a two and it's a two and then it's a two. And, and then we want to know, you know, that makes you wonder, um, who am I doing this for? 
you know, he's not enjoying himself at a two. Yeah, this, this sucks. So it's, I, love, um, I love the idea of the sort of the discipline of doing it when you're not worried and you can be like a little more objective and optimistic. And so, you know, for me, when I just go about life and then when I have a hard decision, it's like, I, I can get flooded with emotion and yeah. um, really doubt if yeah. I'm being objective. And, and this gives you this really nice, it, it, and it's your own, right? So this is my judgment. This is a record of how I thought about things. And now I can compare my own thoughts in, in a way that um, isn't just kind of swirling around in my worried and emotional self. I think this is an amazing idea. Well, it's super simple. And, you know, Karen has, has, has said, you know, with, with four cats, what do you, sorry, uh, not, not, not true. Um, sorry. Uh, Shelly has said with four cats, what do you, what do you do? And with, with four cats, it's, it's like, I, I know I, uh, we've got five cats living here, our three, and then my son and daughter-in-law are living with us for the, for the time being while their house is being built. So there's five cats in the house and I pretty much know whose poop is whose <laughs> and, and like who, who likes to pee in which, which of the, um, uh, which of the uh, six boxes and um, where they pee and how big their peas are. So you can get a sense without locking them in separate rooms. Um, but certainly just also just energy and attitude. Like, do they seem happy? Do they seem um, uh, a a energetic? Do they, um, are they digging into their food or are they kind of sniffing at it, having a lick and then going and lying down? Are they lying down comfortably uh, in a nice, you know, bagel or are they kind of in a, in a meatloaf or, um, uh, uh, you know, trying to get the pressure off their, off their, um, uh, you know, anyways. So things, things like, things and, like that. But and so for those, those, uh, for someone who's kind of, we think we know cats, but then we can learn that there's so much new stuff available, um, that kind of teach us to speak cat in terms of, of pain and quality of life. And, and you've got some great resources here for, um, there's something called the gray muzzle app. Yeah, that's, that's right. I'll get to the I'll get to the next one here, and and this is a, so this is a gray muzzle app, and somebody's already mentioned Lap of Love, and this is it's Lap of Love that's created this. Um, it's an awesome resource, and where you can just score. So right here, you've got uh, this is a just in how is a day, you know, good, neutral, or bad. It's 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 less detailed, but it it it's absolutely gives you what uh, very useful things. Um, Part of the, the, and somebody's also mentioned uh, uh, spot up, spot on here. Um, uh, Brian has mentioned about um, uh, the H5, um, uh, H5M2, which, which I'm going to get to in about uh, five, five or six slides. So, but the gray muzzle app is an absolutely um, uh, so easy to use, really helpful. I hope you'll, you'll grab that one. And, um, and I love this. Heather said, I have an app like that for me. I can do it at the same time. There's a good thing. It's a quality of life for you <laughs> and, a, and a different one for your cat. And that's terrific. So the, this was a really good resource, this brochure from, um, you know, cat, for, cat from the American Association of Feline Practition, Practitioners. How do I know if my cat is in pain? And here's some really good and, and, and simple uh, information. And it as well, I want you to be aware of the feline grimace scale. The feline Feline Grimace Scale is one of the biggest breakthroughs that um, in the last, I'd say, five years in uh, feline medicine, where you just by, this doesn't show you that the how-to, but just by scoring ear position, opening of eyes and, and whisker position, you can get a really good sense of how your cat is doing. And Feline Grimace Scale, you, there's also an app for that too. So the, the gray muzzle is uh, great for just how are they doing overall? And if for, for pain, um, I, I'd really like you to get uh, download the uh, Feline Grimace Scale app. Um, there's, there's another app called Tably. Oh, I'm not, uh, I'm not is, familiar with that one. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it's the Feline Grimace Scale. Um, and it's, it's more, uh, like cat parent friendly and simple to use. Um, you know, I, I know this for is for cat parents. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. Okay. But sometimes we doctors yeah. can make things a little doctory. Okay. This is a little more, uh, you know, so that's tably.com? E-A-B-L-Y, I think. I don't know if there's an E. Do you want to quickly check and put it into the chat box so that we can. You might, I, I'm going to post it after. Okay. Too many steps for me. Um, okay. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, I, I just wanted to stop here to say 
that even as a veterinarian who focused on cats, um, in many, many, many lectures, I would say cats are masters at hiding their pain. And now I don't feel I can say that anymore. What I, what I feel is that uh, they're doing their very best to, to tell us pain, but we, we communicate that very differently. And so it just, the cat looks like it's sleeping to me. So, so that must be fine. And now we have these tools that can, with pretty amazing scientific certainty, show us that no, they are not fine. And they are communicating pain, communicating pain. And I, I just wanted to, like, this is my own process here. When I was like seven years ago, eight years ago, you probably know exactly. I got this big uh, download of pictures and it said, which of these cats is in pain? And I had to score them as part of the group that was um, figuring out this stuff. And I did terrible. I did absolutely terrible. And now that I, we didn't, they didn't give us the score uh, as I recall. So now that I've seen the score and I understand it and I've practiced it and I spend a lot of time on this, now I can see pain really quickly and easily, but I had to have the tool. So, I had to have the tool. Yeah, exactly. And so, um, um, you know, uh, Tabley's iOS only. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Uh, it's only for Apple, not for Android yet. Um, so the way it, the way, the way it works uh, with the, with the ears, you know, upright ears, God, I don't know how I'm going to show this, but upright ears is happy. Exactly. Sideways is, is a little less, less comfortable. And then what I call airplane ears where they're out to the side is that's either, you know, very frightened or very painful. So if we go back to here, you can see the difference in the ears and they're yeah. scored one, like zero, zero. This would be a zero as in comfortable. This would be a one and this would be a two. And then if you look at the eyes, the same thing, wide open eyes, um, is a is a a, a zero um, a narrowing them and where you're kind of getting more of a V from the uh, more of a sharp V. The sharper the V is, the the more pain they're in, um, and so then you you score that. And then the the whiskers here it's a nice relaxed relaxed whisker bed and that where the whiskers are, are kind of flush here you can see that it's not so much the, the whiskers but it's the look at the pooching here how it's starting to get really pooched and really really tense as if they're gritting their teeth or something where they're and that that moves the whiskers so what you're seeing whoops what you're seeing here then is come on is you you get this the whiskers being relaxed here getting getting more and more tense and spread out here as the cat and you and you add it together um you know so it's the score could be anywhere from zero all the way up to nine and the higher it is the more um uh, pain there and i love in. that this is it's it's taking a couple of different things into account um we, oh, we sorry the fourth thing Fourth thing, forgot the fourth thing. It's not, actually not showing on here is because I'm going, it's not zero to nine, it's zero to 12. Because the fourth <laughs> thing is position relative to the, relative to the, the, the body, the head position. So if, you know, the head nice and up is a zero and as it goes kind of down and it's, is um, at the same level as the, as the shoulders, um, you get a higher, uh, you grade it higher. Sorry for interrupting Liz. No, that's okay. I, I just, I think that um, we can get tricked into believing one thing or another when we're only looking at one thing. And in an animal, the more that we can look at the whole picture, you know, we have ears, eyes, whiskers, you know, head position and evaluate all of them together to get a, like a, a more complete sense of how things are going. Um, I have a cat who, uh, she's, she's like a, a little more on the sleepy side, super happy, active, fun, everything's fine. But, you know, she kind of keeps her eyes closed a lot. And so my, my, 12 year old would say like, oh, she, why is she sad all the time? Is she sick? All, Cause she loves the grimace score. And like, no, we have to look at all the things. We have to look mm -hmm. at all the things. Yes. So, and that's, um, you know, Ashley's just uh, said here too, um, or pardon me, Heather said, when should be looking at them to determine this? What if they're laying down sitting or does it matter? Or are they eating or whatever? Somebody else asked if they're eating, um, et cetera. So where this doesn't work is if somebody's just woken up and they're, you know, they're kind of looking really sleepy because they're going to look, you know, their, their ears are going to be relaxed and their eyes are going to be shut, but the whiskers shouldn't be pooched. Okay, their whiskers shouldn't be pooched. The other thing, and their head is going to be down. The another time where it's really difficult to tell is is if somebody's got a cold, because then I mean they're just trying to breathe, and so everything's going to be feeling. So this is why it, it yeah that gets to be really difficult to to assess uh, pain when they're if they've got a if they've got a cold. And someone right? asked so, about third eyelid. Yeah, third eyelid's a pretty obvious one for I don't feel good. I think 
Yeah, but a third eyelid elevation can also happen if they've got internal parasites. There's, you know, it's, it's, it's well, yeah. And that's just, I don't feel good. You know, yeah. I, I, yeah, there's and something wrong with me. interesting. I, I want, we, we have a lot more to learn. And as we get, you know, millions and millions of cats using yeah. grimace scores, we're going to get a lot more information. Um, but uh, do we know that it's just pain or is it discomfort, right? Yeah, or, or fear. So we, we because in the, in the, work. in the hospitals really, or in a, like in a, in a hoarding situation or a very big multiple cat house situation, um, there can be a lot of, of, of fear going on. Um, that is, uh, that may look like this and, and the, um, the, um, uh, the be la 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 gosh, there's so, so much here. So this is all, all on such great questions. These are, conditions. and then for age, yeah, so much of this though is, is, is <laughs> we're really talking pain. <laughs> Do we have, I think this is going to be a number three. Do, <laughs> so the scale doesn't account for age. Um, you aren't uh, you aren't necessarily droopy at twenty. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, age age is not a disease. Age does not make you slow down. Um, things happen as you get as you age that may cause pain or dehydration or low potassium levels or things like that that then manifest as old as being old. Yeah, but age itself is not an issue. So 20 is, you know, that's, that's wonderful. But if, if she's droopy, I'd wonder, is she hydrated? Is she painful in her joints? You know, if she's not moving in a fluid way and running up and down stairs, there's pain. Okay. Um, a dehydration causes pain as I talked about last time too, or several times. Um, so and yeah. The thing I want to also, um, make sure I, I say as we're talking about the grimace score and any of these any of these so far is it's a moment in time so yeah. um back i forget the name of the person who said really beautifully that cats can really bounce back and as a vet you know i go through my own journey i've had cats where i was like there is no way this guy's gonna get better but the people want to try so i try and don't you know yeah. the cat that came in it, like it, i thought it was like a, a a stuffed animal it was so dehydrated and, and like almost hard and that cat 21 years old went running home so yes. we have these moments of time that we have to evaluate somehow in a bigger picture and then can we intervene in a way that is going to make meaningful change or not so like which is why i like the diary yeah you know the, the diary. idea of, of because the thing is it's human nature that when things are going caca we tend to be focusing on you know that's it life is over it's awful yeah. you know whereas when things are going fine you don't even pay any attention to it and and so what we that's why it's useful to see that there's a, a whole bunch of twos are, are going on at, at the, as far as you know your scale of one to ten where you go yeah the saints so you know this this has been going on for now a week uh, doesn't seem to be oh look it went up to three oh Oh, it went up to four. Maybe she's getting married. Oh, it's down to two, 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 um, a four, two, two. Then you know whether it's wishful thinking or whether it's actually um, um, uh, the time. So and we have again, to. Wait, before we move on, I just want to say again, this is where I think a good con communication with your vet matters because is it a broken leg that's repairing and we're having this highs and lows of pain and dealing with it? Yeah. Or is it end stage, um, you know, kidney disease or or uh, uh, end stage lymphoma or something like this where where we know we can't make it better. So uh, having that, uh, do we know that we can't make this better or should we hang in there and we can make it better? And it's so overwhelming. Yeah, and this is the thing is, this is why like the feline grimace scale was not designed to, as a tool to determine when it's time to say goodbye. It was designed to make sure that your cat is, that their that um, pain is being adequately addressed. This is really important. So if you've got the, the the two are, are very different things. And when we get to the 5H uh, to M scale, that'll become more apparent because pain is just part of the um, uh, equation. And pain is can be arthritis, but otherwise the rest of your life is great. Or it could be you've just had some surgery and you know, you're finished your pain meds, but but yeah, you're not really, you, you could sure use some more. And this is where the feline grimace scale comes in, where you're saying he was really good yesterday, but today he's, you know, he's, he's now showing me a, a he's a, a, an, an eight on this, on the feline grimace scale out of 12. And so therefore I need to call my vet and say, I think he needs a couple more days of, of, of meds um, sort of thing, rather than that, 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 oh gosh, he's an eight. Therefore I need to euthanize him. No, that's diff completely different topic. Yeah. And so you have another 
oh, oh yeah, who am I doing this for? Sorry. Yeah, and this is where you know it's really, really started with the uh, with uh, it, as it is there's the art and the science. And are you keeping? Are you doing all these tests? Because you you think you're you know you want to give him all the days he's 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 allotted you want to make sure that he's uh, you, that you can try and um, cure him uh, if at all possible or manage his disease but he absolutely loathes going into the clinic he he, he hides from you whenever you you give him meds his his life has become miserable is that really worth it you know, for him, because we have to kind of climb into the cat skin and, and imagine if this were me, if I was responding in this way in, in my life, how much would I want to be alive? Is this how I want my life to be? And you I know? think it's worth talking about the medicating them because there, there's very few cats who love getting pills jammed down their throat. And actually there's some great stuff for, for younger, healthier cats that can get, uh, you can teach them to take medicine in a way that is actually fun and happy. Um, yeah, <clears throat> and Ingrid Johnson's page is, is really good. Ingrid Johnson, um, what's she, feline, what's she call herself? Um, if you look up Ingrid Johnson, I can, uh, fundamentally feline, I think it is. Is she fundamentally, fundamentally feline? Fundamentally yeah, fundamentallyfeline.com, presumably. And Tabitha Kusera has a bunch too on um, cherubs and chatter. Yeah, of, of yeah. Training to to take meds, but but because uh, you can get you can get them to where they actually come. Like my our our um sixteen year old, he starts hurting us at around eight o'clock because he it's time for his fluids and his meds because he gets churu and cat it throughout the whole time, and so and the others uh, come along too because they get little licks of it as well. So it's it's pilling these guys is no effort whatsoever. And, you know, I want it for people that are having to give multiple pills. I, I don't, I learned the secret of the gel cap way back when and yeah. fi finding ways that it's less, less jams down the throat. Yeah, um, absolutely. There's, there's, there's some techniques that we can use to make that easier because just getting pilled twice a day, every day, if that is traumatic for the cat, it start, it's time to start thinking about what is, who are we doing this for? And I, again, there's not, yeah. there's not a cut and dry answer here. And uh, there's going to be, maybe, maybe we need to be talking. You need to be talking to your vet then about how can I make this less stressful for her? How can I make this more enjoyable for her? Because, you know, Sue said she, her cats love it. And, all, um, so, uh, you know, people have been saying this works, this works, this works. And it really, it really does. But again, not for everybody yeah. but it does work for many so we want to be trying um and but we still also have to step back and say is this working or not because if not who am i doing this for yeah and it's a tough question it's kind of a showstopper you know it, it'll yeah. take the breath away but, yeah um but it's worth we we uh, you know we we get on these a human being we get on these paths of where we are gonna fix it we're gonna fix it we're gonna fix it and then at some point it's like mm, or, or, you know, maybe it's the end and we get so worried and sad. And it's like, actually, maybe we could try this other thing and get a lot of time. Yes. So, so there's not one answer. There's not one answer. So, so the eight tools that you have here, I'm so excited to have some actual concrete tools. If you're stuck in that, I don't know what to do. Tell me about yeah. that. Okay. So we've got, you know, here's the H5, as you can see, the first five criteria start with H and the last two uh, start with an M. So here are you wanting to, um, and, and the uh, 5H, um, 5H uh, to M scale, it actually has a, a scoring system that isn't on this slide, but you can, you can look it up. Um, it's easy enough where we can put a link to it. And this is, um, uh, yeah, Sarah, that's awesome. Uh, we need to ask it for prolonging life or prolonging suffering. That's a very, very, I'm going to quote you on that one. That's a really good one. So hurt, how can the pain be reduced or controlled? What can we, uh, what can we do to improve comfort? And that's where the feline grimace scale or, um, and the diary come in. Hunger, how can we improve appetite? Really important, you know, uh, looking at different diets and appetite stimulant, making them wet, making sure that they're well hydrated, which is the third one. Uh, how can we improve uh, drinking or hydration because subcutaneous fluids, which is doesn't have to be a, a nightmare at all, um, can uh, can really make them feel better. Hygiene, how can we improve hygiene? If somebody is in, in a palliative situation where they can't really get up and get into or out of a litter box, we really need to be thinking 
thinking about is this is this um, uh, fair happiness? What do they love? This is why we want to know when they're when they're not sick. What do they love doing? What is their favorite things? You know, which people are they really connected to? Uh, and then we get into the M's mobility. How can we improve comfort? Um, and and then more good days than bad. And good days being defined as normal activities and daily life, and bad days being defined as not uh, as those that in which nausea, difficulty breathing, pain, discomfort and other you know negative aspects are are present and in this you want it, it, it each one gets each one gets scored you see there's seven things here and they're scored um um uh, one uh, zero actually through um i'm not sure it's one or zero um I, I believe it's zero through um uh five and if you were where um you want to have you know the, the, the lower the score the worse so uh this is uh, your how you score this one um, so whoops, and I'm just doing so the next thing is that it, it comes back to now me, how do I cope and, and um, someone just said about um, liberty here. Um, uh, about uh, Talking about gabapentin for anxiety. Well, I was talking about there's somebody said something about if I hadn't had the, the kitten. If I hadn't gotten the kitten, I wouldn't have been able to survive my older well, yeah, cat dying. Yeah. So this is it. And, and so we have to be, be, be planning. And it doesn't always mean that, you know, getting, getting a kitten or getting another cat, not, not necessarily a bouncy, bouncy kitten. If you're going to get a bouncy, bouncy kitten, get two so they can bouncy, bouncy together rather than um, pester uh, being an annoyance to the, um, to the uh, older or, or sicker cat. Uh, so you know, we want to plan and make some decisions before uh, health begins to decline. So if you've got a cat with, you know, chronic kidney disease at age eight, um, and you want to know, oh my gosh, um, I, does this mean the end is coming? Not necessarily. We could still have six or 10 years uh, ahead of us, but let's start thinking about what sorts of things am I looking at down the road and what sorts of things should I, should I look out for? It's keep, keep up-to-date records of your cat's health, including test results. It's really helpful and empowering to have this stuff um, uh, on, on your, um, you know, keep a file of that. Prepare a backup plan for holidays or when your veterinarian's office is closed. This is especially, you know, if somebody's in palliative, like in, in we know that they're going to die, but we don't know when. Um, so it's, it's, we want to make sure that, that that's all already speak with your veterinarian about the euthanasia process learn what it involves and I know you want to touch on that Liz um so do you want to yeah I I think that um we we tend to talk about all the things that we are talking about but if we are going to choose euthanasia or humane euthanasia to end suffering at some point it actually is a medical process that we have to um gain intravenous access and it helps to talk about this away from the emotion of the moment for everyone, you know, because for both you and for the veterinarian to, to have this conversation so you know what the process looks like. And there's lots of different ways to, to do this well um, with sedating the cat first and, and getting IV access or maybe the, a different technique. But so you understand um, how this is going to be approached, what is normal to see um, you know, ending life isn't always pretty. And so there, there may be some things that could be jarring for you to see. And so knowing what those things might be, like it could be a, a gasp for breath and, and uh, it's just part of the body letting go. But seeing that when it's your true love is terrible. Are they suffering? Or are they not suffering? What am I seeing? How do I evaluate that? Yeah. Did I do the right thing? So understanding the, I don't know if we want to go into the whole process here and now, maybe we should do that at another, in another, um, yeah. time when people yeah. can, you know, come really see all the different ways and hows it, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's, it's, I mean, I've, I've stopped doing intravenous unless somebody already had an IV catheter in years and years ago, I strictly go um, intraperitoneal, uh, it doesn't hurt. And it's a, such a natural process whereby the cat gradually absorbs the flu that the, the euthanasia solution and then um, is a, it but gets sleepy, um, but still could be woke, can be woken. And, you know, you're busy talking with your, uh, uh, you know, this is the perfect time for me to talk with, with um, the, the, the cat's parents about um, how did remind me of what, you know, 
what your favorite thing is that he does and remind me when you got him, how, how did you, how did you guys first meet this sort of thing to start that healing process and be thinking about all the good things that we, sh- that they shared rather than the, the, the sadness and gradually the, the kitty over the next few minutes gets, is anesthetized because it's, a, it is an overdose of an anesthetic solution, you know, so it's, it's um, uh, deliberate and it's an, an anesthetic solution we don't use for, for anesthesia. It's, it's uh, it, cause it's not safe enough. So that's not used for anesthesia under any circumstances, but this is, um, uh, so the, so, so then the cat truly is anesthetized and can't, you know, and, and is, is, um, completely out of it. And then their heart and, and lungs, uh, uh, stop. And, and when they do that, there's less likely to be, but it's not impossible that there may be a gasp. They keep their eyes open. I like to say cats like to know what's coming up, what, what's, what, uh, uh, keep an eye on things. Uh, do they do keep their eyes open and sometimes they may empty their bladder or, or their bowels. And if you know that ahead of time, then should that happen, as Liz says, you know, it's not so, um, uh, it's not so upsetting. Um, and you know, I'm going to, I'm going to talk to the folks at base pause who are just so amazing um, about maybe doing a, um, a a more comprehensive talk about the actual process. Um, and as with most things in veterinary medicine, you you there's lots of options, but things are very very nuanced. Um, and so I think the most important thing of what to choose is what you and your veterinarian decide together that your veterinarian is comfortable with, that you're comfortable with. Um, and that you know is in the best interest of the cat. Um, but I think I think uh, we could probably talk about that for the next five hours. So I, I wanna put a, draw a circle around that, um, put it in a cardboard box and, and come back to it. Cause I think it is important to understand the actual process. Um, yeah. But for today, let's get back to the decision making. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's, let's, let's do that. Then I can see lots of, lots of comments um, about this. So with hospice and palliative care, that doesn't mean uh, that's, that's the period um, where we want to keep uh, the quality of life as optimal as possible before um, the, the time of death. And, uh, and, and it focus where we, where we focus uh, from curing to caring. So even with cats with chronic kidney disease, where it's, it's palliative care, we're not going to get them new kidneys, but this palliative care by keeping those kidneys functioning as optimally as possible with daily subcutaneous fluids. This can go, this can go on for, for years. And certainly in with my cats, it does go on for years and years. Um, and I think it's an important the, thing to say, because we, we, um, we hear these words and we have an immediate reaction. It's very emotional. So hospice and palliative care could mean uh, five hours, but it could mean five years. Yeah, absolutely. Oh. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and it is, uh, you know, if we think about this whole concept of bridge between life and death, well, isn't that everything that's, you know, from the time you're born to the time you die, you know, you're on one trajectory. Um, you know, after birth, it's one trajectory, if you really want to look at it that way, then it can, there can be support if there are, there are hospices. Um, not many out there, but like Lap of Love does does some of this, but Lap of Love really helps you provide uh, palliative care in your home. Um, there are a lot of Lap of Love practitioners around the country. And if you go to their website, you'll you'll see who's in your in your area or closest by, and they can maybe they'll they'll go through and help set up a, a plan with you. And having that plan is so, so helpful. Um, and they don't just drop you with that plan, then they, you know, you you can check in with them and and the like. Um, so there can, there are some um, hospice, sometimes some hospice facilities where supportive care uh, can be can um, be provided. But at home, it really depends on what what you feel comfortable providing, and and hopefully you're open to growing on that. I know a lot of times that I hear from veterinarians all the time that you know my clients won't give daily subcutaneous fluids. To which I say, will they give twice daily insulin? Well, sure. Well, what's the difference? And I think that it's, we, we, it's a, it's a block also, on the veterinarian's perspective. And we're, we're, we're also very rushed, um, all of us. And we're, we're all, I mean, with the pandemic, my gosh, everyone wakes up in the morning, almost exhausted, exhausted and can't even handle one more thing, but to hear the news that something hard is going to happen. And then you have most people like mother nature made us not want to stick needles in things for a really good reason. <laughs> we're not, we're not supposed to be comfortable with that. So we, we need to take a minute and take a breath and say, maybe I, I feel like I can't do any of that. 
and that's okay. And let me breathe. And then maybe I can reconsider and then yeah. like just go through the process of allowing yourself to, to get comfortable instead of just shutting down and saying, I can't, um, yeah. cause you, you can't in that moment. Yeah. But maybe if you give yourself a minute, you can, because it actually isn't that hard. And if you can bring up more peaceful energy to it, then it might actually be a loving bonding thing between you and your cat. It's, it's a matter of actually cats are so much about energy. Oh, you know? 100%. I mean, are, cats, when, are, cats are, yeah, they read like, energy. So like if you kind of tell them kind of a high energy person. So uh, cats really give me a way to say, oh, I'm, I'm bringing too much here. I, I, my energy isn't helping the situation because um, they tell me pretty clearly about that. So we can reorganize ourselves and our, what we think are our abilities to perform a task and to get a hold of ourselves so that we can actually help. Um, the, there's a lot more options. And, and I started this by saying there's beauty in all things. And I know we have most of the people who are with us now have reported that they are crying. <laughs> mm. Oh dear. I don't, I don't laugh because I um, think it's funny. It's so emotional and so- We can relate to it. And, and we, we, we are giving this talk because we've both given an awful lot of thought to um, how, you know, that this is a really important, important process and an important moment for all of us. And, um, and so I just want to say, yes, it's emotional. And if we can look at it as um, a loving process, like how you started this whole thing, and that we can find some peace and beauty and connection and the gift of, of helping our lovely, lovely cat have the best quality of life that they can, and then a beautiful passing. Yeah. Then that's the biggest gift we can give. It's the it's truly the biggest gift we can give. And Maida's asked, well, what, what about people who want their cats to um, pass naturally rather and don't want to euthanize them? And that's why this is so important. You know, how do mo most vets uh, feel uncomfortable with that? But as long as as long as there if there's no pain, as long as there's not an absence of care, then that's fine. It's but it's got to be around that cat has to be comfortable, has to be comfortable and the I whole way through. Is, that's critical. And, and both physically and emotionally. And, and uh, being a, a veterinarian, we've seen suffering, bad suffering, and not every passing that's natural is nice or smooth or, I mean, it can be I mean, it's not really get really hyperbolic about it, but it can be terrible. And so for, for we might think every, that animals just close their eyes and go to sleep. But as veterinarians, we've witnessed that that is rarely actually the case. And that's why we want to be proactive because we, we don't want you to have to see that. And yeah. we don't want your animal to have to experience that. So if we're going to think about passing naturally, we have to understand that that doesn't probably doesn't mean closing eyes and going to sleep. No, that, or, 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 or dying in your sleep. That does not happen often. There's usually and, some seizing or agonal breathing or, or and panic and terror and no. Yeah, it's tough. And, and that is rarely when your vet is open and has a slot for you to come in, right? So now it's two in the morning and you can't get help. And, and it's, um, we, we, the, whole, the reason we have euthanasia is because we don't want anyone to have to go through that. Well, and do you so, remember what you what the term means from the Greek? You're so smart. Tell uh -huh. me. That. Euthanasia is a good death. That's what it means. Euthanasia is a good death. And, and that's how how it that's how it should that's how it should be for for your kitty in particular, but also also for you. And so we can we can find this communication and uh, and I just want to encourage again how can we have this good death for for your loved 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 cat and in a way that you can feel a part of and that you did the right thing and if that's going to be at home without without euthanasia that you were kind and you prevented suffering um because at the end of the day that's where um that's where we really have to be yeah. we owe it to them we yeah. do 
We do. When we take them on, we take them on as, as uh, for, for their life. And so this whole thing, you know, when you're contemplating this and you, you may be feeling overwhelmed and, and shocked, but having a plan adds a sense of uh, a sense of control. And so an end of life plan, and this is, you know, from lap, uh, lap most of this, these um, comments are from lap of love, uh, but not completely. So what are your cat's medical, social and emotional needs? It's not just medical needs. And then we also have to take into consideration in that plan, and this is what your vet, you know, this plan is something that ideally your veterinarian would help you uh, discover uh, for, for yourselves or uh, somebody from um, uh, Lap of Love. What are your needs, beliefs, and goals for your cat? Do you want kitty to die at home? Um, do you, uh, uh, um, is it maybe um, because of, you know, Buddhist philosophy or, or, or whichever? What do you want and need to know? And your veterinarian should be like, what is the process? And, and how long do you think I, he can live? And, and with your veterinarian to develop a personalized plan that meets your and your cat's needs not just your needs your cat's needs because ultimately this is your cat's life only life okay and it's not you know we can get into reincarnation and stuff like that but we have to that that that, that then becomes philosophical but it's it's about um it's your cat's precious life it's not about how you feel about it and and it's that's very very important but equally if not maybe more important is what are your cat's medical, social, and emotional needs? Maybe they can go on for quite some time, but they've given up and they really would rather leave. And so I always ask a cat, and I've actually uh, on more than one occasion told a client that I can't euthanize them because they've told me they're not ready yet, is listen to what the cat's telling me. And that doesn't mean necessarily with my eyes and my ears, it's with my intuition and, and other things. So this you is need where to also- again, the grace comes in because yeah. one person's, perception and experience is going to be very different than another and understand that if you're working with the right your your team that all wants the same thing that you got to be able to communicate that in a way that you're not hurting each other yeah. um because everybody wants the same thing we want your cat to and you to have yeah. a a peaceful um experience that that has minimal pain and the one i, I come back to practical stuff a lot because when we're talking about an end of life plan, we can we can think of it um, with, well, I want it at home or I want it here. Yeah. But let's talk about when, it, if you're gonna do it at home, who's gonna come? When are those hours? With COVID, you know, it makes everything even that much harder. Yeah. Um, what is the practicality of- and if, you, and if you can't have them at home um, because they're scared of going to the clinic, can we pre-med them at home with some gabapentin, with some whatever, so that then they're already gorked when, as they come into the clinic and they're not worried about it. And you're the one who's, you know, given them this, this um, grace of, of being less aware for this final trip sort of, if, sort of if thing. If it's going to be, if it, you're not going to plan it um, well into the disease process, uh, you know, then, then you might not be at your veterinarian. You might be at an emergency hospital or have to, you know, you need a plan for that because that, that's part of the plan is what are the unexpected variables? Exactly. Exactly. So, and certainly providing palliative care, be that for pain, be that for hydration, be that for uh, nutrition, be that for mobility, be that for hygiene, you know, those are things we have to learn how to do. Um, then, uh, and Jennifer, I do see your question. I will get to the, uh, the grieving question. And then who do you have to provide emotional support during this, this uh, end of life process, as well as after death? extremely, extremely important. And um, so there's, there's fortunately, you know, Kevin's been posting that he's got a, um, uh, a, a, a service available on online. There are, there are other people who have services. There are, um, uh, there are pet uh, grief uh, um, hotlines available. I know Cornell has one, lots of the veterinary schools have them um, and they're absolutely free. You just, you just call the 1-800 number and there will be somebody there 24-7 to talk with you, whether it's at three in the morning or whether it's when you just walk down the 
grocery aisle and you were walking past the camp that the, the canned tomatoes and you burst into tears that is 100 percent normal grieving is is um is a well, 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 well we'll hold on to that for a second so how do i know when it's time so we have this personalized plan we're going to plan for the approximate timing of death as 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 uh, lisa said and that's more difficult now with covid and it's flexible as long as there is no suffering and that is the cardinal cardinal rule we've talked uh, earlier about the, the medical process and hopefully we'll have a chance to talk further about that and planning for care of remains so that you're not sitting there, you know, you're an emotional wreck. Um, all you know, you're, you're feeling either, you know, just overwhelmed with everything. You're feeling numb and, and it's, and it's, um, and then somebody wants to know, do you want um, Fluffy's remains cremated or do you want them buried or do you want no care for them or what, what do you want? And it's just, and, and it's just overwhelming. So to know ahead of time, Yes, I want him cremated and I want his ashes back or I, I want him cremated I, uh, individually, I, uh, but I don't want his ashes back or he can be cremated communally or whatever or am I or, or is there a pet cemetery near you that you that you um, want to uh, get a plot for or whatever it is let's discuss that ahead of time and and the cost because and the cost these things cost money and in the throes of it I mean I, when my cat I said my Carlos um, died of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and we he was young and I, I was not expecting that and um even for me in the veterinary profession, this is not that long ago, to talk about individual cremation and cost is brutal on that day, just brutal. And, and so, but, but that's the fact of life. It, it just costs money. And so having that conversation outside of when, when you're in the moment, if like, like, I know this is crazy vet's office, but how does this work here and what does it cost? So yeah. I can think about it yeah. when I'm not- When I'm when rational. I'm, when, when I'm, I'm rational. Yeah, yeah. When I'm not flooded with emotion because it's, yeah. it's too much and it's too hard. And what ends up happening then is we just get angry. Yeah. Um, and that's not what we want for you on that day or for your. Yeah. And you don't want to feel that you've been taken advantage of, or that you made a that you made the mistake. I really did want to just as his ashes back or, you know, and, and uh, do you want a paw print? You, you know, I, I, like I always, you know, I'd always do a paw print and I always make sure this is gorgeous soft fur right here on cats. It's the softest forever shave some of that and give that to give that to um, uh, the care gently and, you know, put, putting it, shaving it with the client there putting it into an envelope and labeling it for for them and so these these sorts of things they can make a make a huge huge difference and, and maybe even just on this note um with with cremation and everything think about a budget because not everyone has that extra couple hundred dollars laying around and you don't want to have that be a meaningful thing for you and and mm -hmm. not be able to do it because of you know it's just it's all too much um, you know, and then feel that and then feel you've been taken advantage of when in fact it's just like you know that's what the vet has to pay to um uh you know for the service to, have, to to be done yeah so just having clarity on all those things not in the moment really exactly and then should i be present and this is where i say i, I, I this is where i say ask yourself if i'm two weeks from now if i look back at this moment which would i which do I will I wish that I have done? And so, and most of the time people choose to be present and it's such a gentle, at least with intraperitoneal, it's such a gentle transition. And it's so natural, whereas intravenous is like a live one second push dot gone. And that's really jarring to our whole sense of security that life is so fragile. So, which is why I, I, switched over but that said it's it's being present is so helpful and then you can still uh even if it is intravenous because you can because your vet will say okay uh, um you tell me when you're ready you know and uh so that's uh, then and then um it's uh, that um needle is administered but and you need to decide do, that for yourself with, with being present um we don't expect anything from you or of you. Not at all. Um, Not whatever, at all. Grieving, but this is kind of part of our life. So don't, we, you know, we'll have the tissues and if you need to, whatever you need to oh, do. We're bawling too. 
Yeah, usually. I mean, it's it's a snotty process. I'm it's really, definitely a snotty process. I'm having trouble not crying right now. Yeah. So, it's, it's, <laughs> um, you know, we can't. That's why we do this yeah. because we care. And we, we care love about you. you and we care about your cat. And so we we want if you want to be present, don't not be present because you're afraid of how we'll judge you. We're not judging you. Not at all. We don't you. care how you're dressed. We don't care ever. We don't care how, you know, if your mascara is halfway down to your ankles, we don't care. Yeah. I tend to like have a lot of boogers, which is really charming. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's but- really charming. And, and like never, ever when I'm practicing, do I ever wear mascara ever? I know there's going to be a good chance of crying. Yeah. Okay. So people will also ask, should my kids be present or should my kids not be present? And this is where I think there's a lot of, a lot of misinformation or mis mm, belief out there where people will often think that, oh, it's going to harm my kids. It's going to scar them. Kids are a, a way more resilient and more pragmatic. And B, if it's this, it's this whole thing where if you, um, Tell them, you know, if you make up a story and then we've probably some of you have had this happen where you where you went to school in the morning as a kid and you came home and your parents said, you know, that that, you know, Fluffy's gone or whatever sort of thing or has disappeared or whatever. And that and then and, and this lie makes you never trust them again. And so it's really, really um, important to uh, give them the chance. Do you want to be with them? And and you know, they most of the time want to be there. They most of the time they want to be there. And I just want to say too, uh, when, when we got, when my Carlos died, we had a few minutes and we went and picked my daughter up from school and um, watching your child grieve. It's, I think that's why a lot of people don't do it actually, because it's too hard to watch. You're having all your emotions and then you have to watch your kid grieve too. Um, So it is hard. There's, it's, there's, but don't deny them that, but don't deny them that. And, and for us to think that, and for us to not have them there for that reason is then selfish. Because the kid needs space, to be able to. Holding space for someone else's suffering yeah. is one of the most loving things that you could ever do. And another, another thing too, and I love this. Yeah. I love you more than tuna is a great book. Um, the, another thing that is, uh, that's really, uh, important as, as well is, uh, and I just lost that because I was paying attention to, to that, uh, that, that comic book. The tuna. So this book admit. is about, this was written by, um, uh, a veterinarian. Um, one brave boy and his cat. And it's a story of a family whose cat has been run over by a car. When a veterinarian tells them that their pet cannot be saved, the father asks the vet to mislead their young son about the extent of the cat's injuries. And the vet instead speaks to the child alone. And the young boy decides that euthanasia is the only humane course of action. And the book talks about the guilt, because a lot of times that's the guilt that the parents feel, the re- and the, the relationships between children and adults and between children and pets. And so we really need to give um, kids this chance to be involved in this freeing of the spirit. And it, it really is a beautiful, you know, back to how we started with it, so it can be a really beautiful experience and really a very spiritual experience and, 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 and joyous and actually, um, you know, when people ask me, you know, God, it must be so hard to be a vet. You must just hate uh, uh, euthanizing. And, and for me, it's like, no, I, I, I don't because the only time I euthanize somebody is when I believe it's the best thing for that cat and when it is the only humane thing to do. And so it's actually a gift and a release. And anyways, in my practice as a, as a, as a consequence, and this is just was my philosophy, it's, and it's weird, we never charged for euthanasia because it was, a, it was a gift, but it wasn't something that, you know, but that wasn't sort of, you know, we, we, we it wasn't that we never we didn't try to help them. Of course we did, but it's, it's when it's time, um, when it's the best option for, for, um, I've uh, actually had that Margie. I don't know if you have too, where, um, uh, owners ask me to lie about things yes. and, um, I, I have my own personal moral code and, yeah. and I want this to be a beautiful thing. And I have to say, I do understand because we're, they're trying to avoid pain and they're trying to avoid um, putting other people in pain and it comes from a loving place, but, um, the lying and deception around this moment is, it's ends up in my opinion, it ends up being harder and worse for everyone. Yeah. Um, and, 
don't, please don't ask me to lie ever. <laughs> yeah. And this is the thing is, I mean, don't, uh, uh, and don't ask me to euthanize somebody where something can be done either, because um, yeah. that's, uh, uh, and, and money is a secondary thing. We can always work something out. And, and this is really, um, I, I have taken a, a, a vow, sworn an oath to help. You know, yeah. and that's uh, something I take very seriously. So should other pets be present? Um, I would say generally not. Um, generally, it is, uh, you know, uh, generally it freaks them out um, more than anything, um, at, rather than at helping them understand. Now, other pets, you know, cats or dogs, they may or may not grieve. And how do cats grieve? Well, some cats do grieve. Uh, some cats don't grieve, um, but or that we can see, and that may be the, la the lack of our ability to see, but some cats change the amount they meow, they may become more chattery or less, less talkative, they may lose their appetite and stop eating, they may become depressed and listless. Uh, may have less energy, sleep more, or or move slowly, just sort of be lethargic. They may lose the desire to play. They may hide and want to be left alone. So really, they may sleep in uncharacteristic places, uh, or they may sleep where their companion used to sleep or avoid that area completely. Um, or they may also even, um, uh, uh, they, they may be excessively needy or clingy, um, over groom themselves, stop using the litter box or start you know, using, uh, going to the bathroom in inappropriate places. Uh, they may um, also not appear to, to, to grieve, but some cats actually really come out of themselves now when that other cat is gone. So now, it's- You can't really know necessarily what to expect. Um, there's so many things going on. And when we think about behavior in cats, what we're seeing some outward signs and how we interpret that I don't know. I'm getting less and less sure that I know what a cat is thinking. Absolutely. Um, and so, yeah. so I think it, you, and you're probably going to be upset and your energy is going to be different. The yeah. energy of the humans in the household is going to be different. So your cats are going to have to, your other animals, whatever they may be, are going to adjust to that also. And, and then this whole reshuffling of the missing member of the family. It's a lot. And you may see some outward signs like these, or you may not. And again, uh, this is where I think grace comes in for everyone. And if the one cat who maybe the, the, the newly deceased cat was giving a hard time, that cat might be thrilled, like you yeah. said. And, yeah. and that like, that's okay. I mean, sometimes it's actually where the two cats appear to get along really well, but you know, little Missy was always kind of the quiet one and, and, you know, and, and Buster was the outgoing one and Buster dies and all of a sudden Missy just blossoms. So it's, really, know, it's really funny. Some, somewhere down the line that with Lap of Love and, and these other organizations who focus on this, that we can get some research on, um, uh, and particularly your question of should my other animals be present? Um, I, I, for my personal opinion, I, I want to be able to focus on my job too. And so like a bouncy Labrador retriever when I'm trying to perform, like that's, that seems weird, but um, I don't think that I know. And, yeah. and, uh, and I wish that we had some data there about what that was like. I, I, I practice equine medicine. And one of the things that the, the person who trained me as a, an equine doctor said was we let, we, when we dropped the drop, we euthanized the horse in the field by itself, but they let, let the other horses come out and sniff it and understand yeah. it. Yeah. Um, and this is, I mean, I've done, I've done this and I've seen some pretty dramatic, yeah, I have uh, terrifying, you know, where other cats are. So I, whether they were going to go off their food anyways, I don't know. Um, so I, 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 like you, I don't know. And we don't have any, you know, data on that whatsoever. So again, use your intuition there. Um, but a cat that's mourning the loss of another cat may actually become ill. Yeah. So you need to pay attention to, to pay attention to that. And back to Jennifer's, um, um, uh, question about how long is it normal for a person to grieve? My goodness, there is any, any time is normal. And it could be, uh, it could be um, uh, uh, half a year, it could be um, three years. Um, 
can we have decades? <laughs> yeah, we can. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, it's 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 no different than for for a person. With some some people, it's like uh, it's uh, and and that's going to be very very different for the individual as well as who it is who's died uh, and your relationship with them and how you handle things. And and remember, that, and I could do a whole thing about about um, you know caring for the caregiver as well. And I I don't I think um, this is my like not doctor opinion. This is my Liz the human opinion you don't have to tell everybody because there's going to be people who are not yeah. connected to animals who will oh it's just a cat why don't you get another one say terrible things or what they don't mean or whatever maybe they do mean it maybe they are terrible but you i think that this grieving process is precious and sacred and um finding people who can support you in that time is really special and it's not going to be everyone so it's something to think about maybe who you want to share that with and who you don't because for me, when I'm fragile and someone says the wrong thing, it can really set me back and, um, you know, protecting yourself a little bit there. Because we don't have a real process for this. When In certain religions, when humans die, there's a, there's well, she, a, a but, lot of yeah. process that helps people know what to do, what to say, how to be. And, and in animals, we really don't have that. And um, I think that that's a shame because for, for people, um, I know for myself and basically every client I've ever worked for, this is a very devastating and meaningful transition. Um, and it would be nice if we had some more um, cultural understanding of how to care for each other in that moment. Yeah, and it's 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 Jen said something really lovely that grief is love persevering despite death, and I think that's lovely. And I like to think of it as being, you know, um, uh, uh, tear, tears are liquid love, you know, and 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 it's this, and and there the only reason we have them is because we had this amazing gift of this relationship. Without having had this gift, and the other we wouldn't we wouldn't be feeling this. And so rather than focusing on the loss, focusing on the, the joy and the, the time we had together and the very fact, the whole time we're with someone, be it, you know, um, a, a kitty or a, a person, um, uh, a, a human person, a non-feline a non person, um, we, we grow and change in response to each other. So as a consequence, truly, truly, Jennifer, your, uh, your kitty is still with you. He's become part of who you are. They do not leave us because we have changed in response to them. And, and I think it's even, the, the routine stuff is really hard too. I just want to touch on that. So particularly if you've had an ill cat that you've been caring for and your life and your schedule has been built around being there yeah. and um, sort of rituals of how you do all your life and now they're gone and there's just a lot of adjusting that has to happen there on on the human side um that's just it's just all hard it's all hard and and um i don't know if we can say like we we love that you love your pets and we we honor that it's going to be a real process for you when it's time for them to go yeah yeah. So Shelly's asked, where do we find the number for help after uh, a grief support 24 hours? I would look, I would uh, Google, like, because I can't be doing multiple things at once here. Um, uh, I'd, I'd lose you guys if I, if I uh, tried to look this stuff up right now, but I would Google um, pet support, uh, pet support grief um, lines and you will, and you should come up with Cornell and Davis. And there's, there's uh, quite a few of them. But we really are, you know, as, as Jennifer has been so, so generous with sharing in this process of, of sort of in dystopian, you're functioning day to day to day, but underneath it all, you're constantly being eaten alive by memory of the, your time together, or, or it comes and comes when you're in that tomato aisle, you know, all of a sudden, like not even the pet food aisle, it's the tomato aisle, tomato sauce aisle. And so this is a, a, a really, you know, precious thing. And, and to, you know, follow up with a with the um, um, uh, what uh, Jen said, there's a cycle. Uh, there's a cycle of love and death that shapes the lives of those who choose to travel in the company of animals. I love the wording of this. Who choose to travel in the company of animals? It is a cycle unlike any other. To those who have never lived through its turnings or walked its rocky path, our willingness to give our hearts with full knowledge that they will be broken seems incomprehensible. 
Only we know how small a price we pay for what we receive. Our grief, no matter how powerful it may be, is an insufficient measure of the joy we have been given. And Liz can't talk right now. <laughs> so I just want to say that it's there are the gift, you know, don't let the the don't let the sorrow prevent you from giving your heart and your home to somebody else. And don't um uh, uh you know just let that because cats come to us, let that cat come to you when it's time and keep your heart open to that moment, to that individual, so that individual can find you. And when they go, when it's their time, rather than clinging to them through every medical means possible, um, while caring for them appropriately and doing what is feasible, be ready to embrace them lovingly so that you can let them go. So to sort of summarize it all, because Liz is without words right now, senior cats are the best, absolutely love them. The signs of sickness are subtle. This is going back to November. We want to look for changes in mobility. We want to weigh our cats regularly. We Regular checkups are a must. We want to screen by doing blood work and urinalysis and checking blood pressures. And yes, there are somebody to ask, are there blood pressure medications for cats? Yes, there are. And the best protection is early detection. We always want to be looking at quality of life, not just the number of days, but the number of quality, and that the end of life can indeed be a beautiful experience. And that's the thing I guess I want to close with is there really is beauty in all things. And for this community of people who live in the presence of this connection with each other and with animals, um, somehow we need to find the beauty and the connection even in this grief process. And, and I hope that um, this has helped start that connection if it's something that you haven't found and that we can, we can be there to support each other. Yeah. Thanks everybody. Sending love. Love to you, sweetie.